This is the sine function tutorial. The sine function can be written as y is equal to the sine of theta. The easiest way for me to explain the sine function to you is going to be through the use of graphs. Here's what a typical sine function looks like on a graph. I'm also going to bring in an image of the unit circle here to help with this explanation. Any point located here on the sine function, so any point along this wave right here, is going to correlate directly with the y value of an angle in standard position on our unit circle. So if I had a point here at the top of our sine value, so let's say this point right here, that's going to correlate directly to the value of y of an angle in standard position over here on the unit circle. So remember, standard position is when an angle is formed where one ray of that angle lies on the x-axis, like I've drawn here in red, and the vertice of the two rays joining each other to make that angle lies at the origin of this unit circle, or of our coordinate plane here. So if I were to draw an, another ray straight up right here, this point where this ray, the terminal side of this angle in standard position here, that point where it intercepts the unit circle, the y-coordinate of that value right there correlates directly with the y-coordinate over here on this sine function. So let's take another look at one of these points. Let's take a look at this point right here on this sine function. If I were to draw a line directly across here, to the imaginary unit circle off to our left, that point that I indicated here with the arrow on that sine wave is going to correlate exactly to the y-coordinate of the point right here where this angle in standard position, so if I made theta here, this is the angle in standard position, the y-coordinate of that intersection point of the terminal side of that ray passing through the unit circle is going to correlate directly with the y-coordinate, so the y-value, of that point right there, and so on and so forth. If you just drew lines directly across relating these two, you'd see that the pattern would go up and down like this. For example, look what happens if I choose this point right here. On our sine function, I'm going to draw a line connecting directly across to our unit circle. Now take a look at this line and notice that this point right here on the unit circle, the y value of that point is going to correlate directly to the y value of that point on the sine curve over here. So if you were to draw an angle in standard position, you'd have that original ray right here along the x-axis, and then you'd have another ray joining it right there at the origin of our coordinate plane. So this would be your angle in standard position. Remember, for standard position here, if you wanted that to be a positive angle value, we'd have to go counterclockwise. Now, if you chose a point over here on this side of our sine function, it's going to correlate to a value directly over here on this side of our unit circle. And as you go all the way around our unit circle like this and correlate points. So if I were to go counterclockwise like usual around our unit circle, those values would coordinate directly just like this. At that same time as you're going up and left on the unit circle, you're going up and right on this sine function. Then you go down and that's correlating to this region over here. You go down along the sine function. You max out at the bottom, so down here on the unit circle at negative 1. Then you start to climb up and right again. And that's you climbing up and right again on the unit circle over here. And you continue on doing that as you make rotation after rotation around the unit circle. That sine wave is going to go on forever to the left and right. And it's just correlating exactly to making rotations over and over about that unit circle. Up and down, left and right, that kind of thing.
Now I'm going to clean up these graphs a little bit and we're going to actually apply that to some problem work. Now that you can see how they correlate together the unit circle with an actual sine function and if you put a sine function into your calculator so just y equals sine x in your calculator's graph utility and then watch the graph it's going to look just like this curve but again it's going to go left and right forever in both directions and you'll be able to apply that to what we're doing here with these problems. Alright so the question is what is the value of y equals sine theta when theta is equal to 90 degrees? Well if you find 90 degrees over on our chart here, so 90 degrees over on our sine function, 90 degrees if you go straight up correlates right here to this position. And if you go straight across that dotted blue line, you'll find that the y coordinate, that value there, is 1. So the value of y equals sine theta when theta is equal to 90 degrees is one unit. If our unit circle were in meters, it would be one meter. If it were in feet, it would be one foot. Now what about when theta is equal to 360 degrees? Well again, we'll come over here and look at 360 degrees on our sine function. At 360 degrees, our sine wave here in orange is just passing back through the x-axis. So the y value of our graph as it's passing through the x-axis is going to be zero right there at the x-axis. So when theta is equal to 360 degrees, our value here for the function y equals sine theta is zero. So whenever anyone asks you what the value of a function like a sine function here y equals sine theta is at a particular measurement like let's say when theta is equal to 90 degrees, just go ahead and look on your sine function find where the graph happens to be at 90 degrees on your calculator you could trace along there and then correlate that back to its y value on the graph. Now let's go ahead and do the same kind of problem but if our graph weren't in degrees if it were in radians. So here's what our graph would look like if it were in radians. We'd change out our measures of 1, negative 1, that sort of thing over here on a unit circle to 2 pi, pi over 2, pi, and 3 pi over 2. Now remember, this value here is either 0 or 2 pi depending on how you look at it. If you were to do a full rotation about the unit circle and come back here, then you've gone 360 degrees and a total value of 2 pi. This value up top here, pi over 2, is just one fourth of the distance around the unit circle. And the distance around the unit circle is 2 pi units. So one fourth of 2 pi is pi over 2. Now notice on our sine function graph over here, we've also changed out these units. 90 degrees now is pi over 2. Where 180 degrees was, we have pi. Where we had 270 degrees before, we have 3 pi over 2. And where we have 360 degrees is now 2 pi. Those are representative of those 90 degree turns about the unit circle. We've cut that circle into force again. So we'll go ahead and drop in our sine curve. Our sine curve doesn't change simply because we're looking at our graph in terms of radians instead of degrees. It's just a matter of how you're looking at it. But it's still making those same turns. It makes that first curve at 90 degrees as it starts to travel down the back side of the unit circle again. It travels downward. It hits zero again on the y coordinate when it hits the x-axis again. Remember, these values over here on our sine wave just correlate directly to the y values over here on our unit circle. So when we're hitting the x-axis here, here, and here, that's just us hitting the x-axis here, here, and back again as we go back around the circle. So if I were to ask you to use the above graph to estimate the value of these sine functions, you could. Let's begin with that 3 pi over 2 radians. Now remember, we just go over to our sine function here to the location of 3 pi over 2 radians on that graph, and we're going to go until we find where that value, that x value, matches up with our sine curve. And we take that y coordinate there of where that graph is, that sine curve, and that's our value of the sine function at 3 pi over 2 radians. Because remember, the sine function is looking at the y value in correlation with our unit circle. So down there at 3 pi over 2 radians, that has a value of negative 1 because it's the bottom of our unit circle down here at the bottom. So this value would be negative 1. Negative 1 unit depending on the size of our unit circle, whether it's in meters, feet, centimeters, whatnot. 
Now let's take a look at the problem on the right. They want us to estimate the value of the sine function at 6 radians. Well remember that the distance around the unit circle is 2 pi radians and pi is roughly 3.14. So 2 times 3.14 is 6.28. So you could say a full trip around the unit circle would be 6.28 rads or radians, whichever you prefer to say. And they want us to go around 6 radians, so almost a full trip around the unit circle. If we started here at our origin and we traveled around the unit circle, if the whole thing is 6.28 rads and we only want to go 6 rads, I'd stop a little bit short of our full trip around the unit circle. Then you could draw a line directly across over to your sine function here. Remember, we're on the back side of the unit circle, so we're going to land over here. And this y value would be the answer. Now to get the exact value, you could go ahead and plug that into your calculator. You'd have to switch the mode of your calculator into radians. And then you could just do sine of 6. If you did that, you'd get a value of negative 0 0.28. If you wanted to just leave your calculator in degrees, you'd have to convert 6 radians to degrees. And remember to do that, you'd simply multiply it by 180 degrees over pi. If you multiplied it by 180 over pi, you'd get 343.77. So remember, a full trip around the circle is 360 degrees, and you went 343.77, which is roughly about here. So if you left your calculator in degree mode and just did the sine of 343.77, you'd get that same exact value, negative 0.28 roughly. All right, so now that you have a basic understanding of the sine function, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the properties of the sine function. Here we have a list of the sine function properties. The standard sine function is y is equal to a sine b theta, where a cannot equal zero and b must be greater than zero. And the absolute value of a is the function's amplitude, which if you recall is one half the difference between the maximum and minimum points on that sine function. And b is the number of cycles in the interval from 0 to 2 pi, when 2 pi over b is the function's period. Now take a look at this guy up top, y equals sine theta. You can refer to that in the future as the parent function of a sine function. It's the parent function because the a and b that would appear here and here respectively have a value of 1. And since they have a value of 1, we don't actually write them into the parent function. You just see it as y equals sine theta. Once we transform that sine function by affecting the a and b value here, you'll start to see changes in your amplitude, your cycles, your period, that sort of thing. So remember, the top function y equals sine theta is your parent function, and then everything else is a transformation of that parent function. Now let's go ahead and work through a sample problem. Here's our problem. I'd like you to sketch one cycle of the graph y equals 3 times sine of the value pi theta over 2 and determine the period and amplitude of the sine curve. Let's begin by establishing what our a and b values are. Remember that the a value is what comes before the sine, the coefficient here. And in this case, it's 3. So the absolute value of that number, so the absolute value of 3, is the function's amplitude. The absolute value of positive 3 is simply 3. So this function has an amplitude of 3. Remember, that's going to be half the difference between the maximum and minimum values of our sine function. Now we also want to look at b. b is the number of cycles in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So we know that b is the coefficient that comes before our value theta. And if this is our value theta here, then what comes before that must be pi over 2. So pi over 2 is the number of cycles in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So our cycles is equal to pi over 2. And 2 pi over b is the function's period, and b is pi over 2, so 2 pi over pi over 2 is the function's period. We can't have a fraction in the denominator here, so I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal. 
which is 2 over pi. And this is going to change to 1 now. So we have 2 pi over 1 times 2 over pi. Our pi's are going to cancel. And we're going to get a period of 4 units. So our period over here is equal to 4 units. So now I can go ahead and graph this figure since I know its amplitude, its cycles, and its period. Alright, so here's our graph. Now let's take a look at our amplitude first. Remember, we said that the amplitude was 3, and the amplitude is half the difference between the maximum point and the minimum point. So the maximum point on our graph is 3, and the minimum point is negative 3. And the difference between that is 6 units. Half of that difference would be 3, so that's our amplitude like we said. So we know that we can go 3 units up and 3 units down from the origin. Now our cycle number is pi over 2. Well, pi is 3.14 roughly, so 3.14 over 2 is 1.57, and we can just Im imagine that to be 1.5 to make it easier. So in the cycle from 0 to 2 pi, we're going to have 1.5 trips, 1.5 cycles. So 0 to 2 pi would roughly be 6.28 units, because 2 times pi, 2 times 3.14 is 6.28. So if this graph continued on, to 6.28 along the bottom, if this were say 6 right here, then our graph would continue to go up and then curve back down and so on and so forth as it went through the cycles. What we should expect is one and a half cycles roughly from that point on the origin here to 6.28 right here. And that's exactly what you see. One cycle, remember, is just when a graph repeats itself. So when it gets to the point of repeat, this right here would be the point of repeat. So our cycle is from here to there. And you can see that we have roughly one and a half of those if this graph is extended to 2 pi or 6.28. Now also notice that our period is 4. The period is the horizontal distance of one cycle. And you'll notice if our cycle began at the origin right here, when it hits 4, which is our period, it's completed one cycle like we just looked at. So hopefully now you have an idea of how to put a graph together based on a sine function. Now we're going to go the reverse. I'm going to give you some data about a sine function and ask you to give me the equation of that sine function. So what I'd like you to do is write the equation for the graph that has a period of 1 half and an amplitude of 4. Well, let's begin with what we know. It has a period of 1 half, and we know that the formula to solve for the period is 2 pi over b is equal to the period. And since our period is 1 half, 2 pi over b must equal 1 half. So what we can do now is use the cross product property rule and cross multiply. 2 pi times 2 is 4 pi, and b times 1 is b. So 4 pi is equal to b. So that's the b here that's going to go on our sine function. Now we also know that it has an amplitude of 4. So the amplitude is our a value. So our a value here is equal to 4. So if we put all that together, we get a function of y is equal to 4 times sine 4 pi theta. Remember that this 4 in front is our amplitude, and this 4 pi here is our b value. So typically when given problems regarding sine function, you're either going to be asked to establish what the value is at a particular point in the sine function, whether it's in degrees or in radians, or you could be asked to draw a graph based on a sine function, or even to derive a sine function based on a graph. It's all fair game in dealing with sine functions, so go ahead and practice how to transform the parent function y equals sine theta into these different sine functions where it's y equals a times sine b theta. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the cosine function. Here's your basic cosine function. y is equal to cosine theta. And if you were to graph that in your calculator, it would look like this. 
It's a nice little cosine curve going through your graph. The sine function relates to the unit circle's y values. The cosine function relates to the values of a unit circle and the x-coordinate. So let me show you what I mean by that. If you were to just draw two dotted lines here that showed a nice height correlation between your cosine function graph here and your unit circle, you'd notice that as the cosine graph peaked at the top and bottom here, it would correlate directly to the peaks of the unit circle graph. Now, just as the y values over here on our sine function graph correlated directly to the y values over here on the unit circle, on the cosine function, like we have drawn here, the x values of the cosine function directly correlate to the x values of our unit circle. So for example, this point right here on our cosine graph, the x coordinate of that point is zero because you can see that that point lies on the y axis. If you drew a dashed line comparing that to the unit circle, where that dashed line intersects the unit circle, you'll notice that that lies exactly on the y-axis too, and the x-coordinate of that value is zero because it's on the y-axis. You'll notice the same down here on the bottom. The x-coordinate of our cosine function has a value of pi right here. If you were to travel straight down to that point that we marked, the x-coordinate there has a value of pi. And if you were to travel from our origin here on our circle, all the way around the unit circle here till you got to a value of pi, which is half the distance around, you'll notice that our x value is negative one. It's one to the left of the origin here. So as you travel around the unit circle, for example, the first 90 degrees here, or pi over two radians, you travel down this cosine function. This point right here on the x-axis is pi over two. And that's exactly this distance here from the origin up to 90 degrees. As you continue to travel along the unit circle, you continue to go down on the cosine function. Once you get to 180 degrees there, you have a value of pi, which you'll notice that's exactly there on the x-axis distance. You continue to travel around, and you get to 3 pi over 2. So if you continue that turn right there, so your x value here is zero as you're getting back through at three pi over two. Then you continue along here up to the top and that's continue along in the unit circle all the way till you get back to where you started at two pi. And when you're at two pi, your x value on the unit circle has a value of one. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the properties of the cosine function. The properties of the cosine function are y is equal to a cosine b theta where a cannot equal zero and b must be greater than zero. The absolute value of a is the function's amplitude, so remember that's half the difference between the maximum and minimum value of your cosine graph. While b is the number of cycles in the interval from zero to two pi, cycles are each time the graph repeats itself, and two pi over b is the period of the function, and the period, remember, is the horizontal distance that each cycle travels. So let's jump into some problems using the properties of cosine functions. I'd like you to draw the graph of the following functions in the interval from zero to two pi. Let's begin with the graph up top. Y is equal to negative two times the cosine of pi over two times theta. Now remember, this value in front is our a value. That's the amplitude of our function. And the absolute value of that is the amplitude, so the absolute value of negative two is two. So that's the difference in the distance from the top of the function and the bottom of the function divided by two. It's one half that difference. Another way to think of that is since our graph is originating at the origin, we're basically gonna be able to go two units up and two units down from the origin. Now take a look at this value here, pi over two. Pi over two is our b value for this function. That's the number of cycles in the interval from zero to two pi. Pi over two is roughly 1.5. So our b value is pi over two, which is roughly equal to 1.5. So we have one and a half cycles in that interval zero to two pi. And two pi over b is the period of our function. So, 
2 pi divided by b, which is pi over 2, would look like this. We have to invert and multiply that bottom fraction, the denominator there, so that would be 2 over pi. This would change to 1. Our pi's are going to cancel, and 2 times 2 is 4. So the period of our function is 4 units. So if I were to draw that whole thing in with our a, b, and our period value, it's going to look like this. I drew it from 0 to 2 pi. So 0 here on the origin to 2 pi, which is roughly 6.28 units. Now notice what our cycle is. I'll just start from here to here. That would be one cycle on our graph up and back down, and then it repeats itself over and over again. Notice how there are roughly one and a half of these. There's this one right here, that initial first guy, as it goes up and down. Then there's another half, so just a trip up, basically. Just a little bit more than that, because pi over 2 is just a little bit more than 1.5. You'll also notice our amplitude. Our amplitude went 2 up and 2 down. And lastly, take a look at the period of our function. Remember, the period is the horizontal distance of one cycle. So, one cycle was from those two blue check marks at the bottom. And notice if you draw it straight up, the horizontal distance there, the distance across the x-axis, is about four units. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the function on the bottom. y is equal to 3 times the cosine of 2 theta. Again, take a look at this value here. That's our a value, our amplitude. So the absolute value of that, the absolute value of 3, is simply 3. So our function is going to go 3 units up from the origin and 3 units down as it travels. Now we can take a look at our b. Our b value is what comes before the theta. In this case, it's simply 2. So b is equal to 2, and that's the number of cycles in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Lastly, we'll plug that b value in to solve for the period of our function. So 2 pi divided by b, and our b is 2, is equal to our period. So 2 pi over 2, the 2 is cancel, the period of our function must just be pi, which is roughly 3.14. So if I were to draw on a graph that meets those requirements, it would look like this. Again, it's in the interval from 0 to 2 pi, which is roughly, again, 6.28. The amplitude of our function is 3, so it goes up to 3 as a maximum value and down 3 from the origin as our minimum value. Now take a look at one cycle. That's the distance from this peak to this peak. Remember, it's just one trip of repeating y values. So that's this whole distance right here. And you'll notice our b value is 2 for this function. So in the interval from 0 to 2 pi, that cycle occurs two times, and you can see that it does. Also, we want to pay attention to the period of our function. The period of our function is pi, or 3.14. And you'll notice that at the end of this cycle, if you were to draw a line straight down, it occurs at roughly 3.14. So you'll notice now that we've drawn our function exactly as it was indicated in the problem here. y is equal to 3 times the cosine of 2 theta. That's all that's involved in plotting a graph based on a cosine function. Now let's take a look at the reverse. If I were to give you a graph and asked you to write the function based on that graph. So what I'd like you to do is to determine the amplitude and the period of this cosine function. Well, the first thing I notice about our function is that it's coming in right here, down at the bottom on the y-axis, which tells me that our a value is going to be negative because a cosine function should be coming in up top high, unless it's been shifted to the left or the right, and we'll deal with that later. So we know that our a value is going to have a negative value. Now we also know that the absolute value of a is the amplitude. So the difference from the top peak value, the maximum, to the minimum divided by 2. So on our graph, this right here, the maximum, is 0.5. And the minimum, if you do a little work here to count down, is negative 0.5. So the difference between those is a value of 1, and half of that is 1 half. So our amplitude A must be 1 half. And like we said, since it comes in at the bottom of the graph here, as it's coming through our origin at 0, it must be a negative value. So our A here is negative 1 half. 
Now to determine b, we can use the period formula for the function, which is 2 pi over b. Now remember, b is the number of cycles in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Well, 2 pi over b is the period of the function. That's the distance to complete one cycle. So if we looked at this value to this value, that's one cycle. It goes down the graph and then back up to that same y value again. And if you look, this value on the left has a value of negative pi over 3, and this value here has a value of pi over 3. So, pi over 3 minus a negative pi over 3 is equal to 2 pi over 3, because minus a negative makes a positive here. So our period 2 pi over b is equal to 2 pi over 3, the horizontal distance to complete one cycle. Well, notice that b and 3 share the same position here, and our numerator is the same, 2 pi, which means that b must equal 3. So the amplitude of this cosine function is negative 1 half. And the b here, the period for this cosine function, is 3. So that's how you deal with cosine functions. We've learned a little bit of how to work backwards from a graph to determine things like the amplitude and period, and then how when given the cosine function to actually draw a graph of the cosine function. You'll want to keep practicing these and do as many of these as you can because they can be a little bit more complex, but if you get down the basics of how to determine your amplitude and your period, you'll be fine in getting through these.